welcome to this episode of Nature Positivity, the podcast where we chat about all the fun things that happen in the natural world over a cup of tea. I'm Holly. And I'm Karis. And for this episode, we're joined by Jasmine Qureshi, a marine biologist and science communicator. Do you have a cup of tea or a hot drink? I do. I have a peppermint. Yeah, it's a peppermint tea. Nice. Do you, Karis? Uh, I don't actually have a kettle at the moment because I'm mid-moving house. So I've got some water. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not got a cup of tea either, which is sad. I plan on having one later. Nice. <laughs> My name is Jasmine Isokureshi and I, um, like you just said, I'm a um, science communicator. Um, I'm also a journalist and a former researcher at um, the BBC's Natural History Unit. Um, I've been writing, speaking about and volunteering in conservation since I was about eight, I guess. And over the years, kind of built up experience in terms of speaking at science festivals and presenting programmes and um, speaking about the links between intersectionality, whether that be um, sexuality, identity, um, queerness, diversity in terms of ethnic diversity and the issues of conservation biology and specifically marine biology which is what um, my degree is in so um yeah i do i do a bit of 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 lots of different things um i'm also um, trans and non-binary i'm also an ambassador for the bumblebee conservation trust and an engagement officer for um, the youth-led wildlife organization of focus on nature How did you first get into marine biology and ecology initially? When I was really, really young, um, I would, so I was homeschooled till about um, year nine. And what we would basically do is just spend a ton of time watching David Attenborough documentaries and just watching stacks upon stacks of documentaries. And that's literally all that we would do. (laughs) And that was our, basically our biology classes at home would be to watch those documentaries and I watched a lot of Steve Irwin and a lot of Spring Watch and I just basically learned a lot about wildlife in the British um, kind of countryside which I really wanted to see but I couldn't see in person because I lived in a flat above a shop in central London and there was no garden there and no reserves or anything and so I really kind of I just I grew this real passion and this love for natural history that I couldn't see and that I desperately wanted to see and I think that made me kind of get out into wildlife and nature and I did that through going to parks which were quite a while away but I still um, made the effort I guess to get my mom to take me to parks and things and visiting reserves as well was something that I used to do a lot and so through that I kind of built up this love of the natural world and of conservation and I loved bugs and plants I think and I still do I think they're kind of top of my list in terms of what I love in terms of nature is entomology I literally would do anything for an insect I love insects so much um I do anything for a beetle um and that is I will put that on everything I'll put that on my CV but um I I just love insects so much I love creepy crawlies and it's interesting because when I was interested in um insects and plants the most it was because they were the most successful because I lived in a city and so those were the ins- the animals basically and the wildlife that I could get to grips with the most and from that it grew into this love of seeing the rest of the world and seeing what kind of overseas wildlife had to offer and how much I could explore and use my love of what I grew in terms of community and society and people how could I map with what I loved in terms of nature and in my head I basically built up this idea that communication is one of the the most amazing, incredible, and fascinating things about the world around us. And and intelligence is also one of the most incredible things about the world around us, especially the world of conservation and nature. And so what if I study the intelligence of communication in one of our basically most mysterious, but most human-like animals in terms of how they communicate? And that is cetaceans, whales and dolphins. And so what I really wanted to study is whales and dolphins. But I still have that love of insects. And I found that when I did marine biology at university, I could talk about um, pollinators. I could talk about um, insects. I could talk about the effects that they had on the world. I could also link it into the ocean. And from there, I could also study whales and dolphins. So I basically, it's, it's basically me just wanting to do everything, but <laughs> having to do one thing. 
So I think that was what drew me to marine biology was this great understanding that you could study some of what I think are the most amazing animals on the planet, which are the marine mammals and specifically cetaceans. And that's still what I want to do. Um, I ended up doing my, um, my dissertation on sharks instead, but which is kind of cool, but like I really wanted to do um, cetaceans. So um, fingers crossed when I do my PhD, it will have something to do with cetaceans, insects, and hopefully intersectionality, which is everything that I do now. So I'm, I'm kind of building up to it. You mentioned the link between pollination and the sea, marine life. What is that link? When we talk about pollination, what we what comes into everyone's mind is bumblebees. And as someone who's a great lover of bumblebees, I, as I said, I do work as an ambassador for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. I, um, I really respect that. And I love that people think about bumblebees, or at least people think about honeybees anyway. It's kind of a no-go, but we'll go into that later. But, um, you know, when people think about pollinators, they think about bees. But a lot of um, pollination is linked to the creation of oxygen in our atmosphere. And a lot of pollination is linked to the creation of food for animals, people, whatever. You know, it pollination basically runs our planet. That's how plants survive. That's how they exist. That's how they create more plants. And um, lots of plants, whether they be big or small, whether they be trees or grass, are underpinning most of our economies, our infrastructure and our environments. We need them so desperately and they need pollination so desperately. So what we're really talking about is the biodiversity that underpins all life on Earth. Now, if we were to actually go into that, we would actually have to talk about algae and we'd have to talk about the oceans and how the oceans produce most of the oxygen, but also most of the biosphere and most of the materials that our biodiversity um, relies on. And so if we're talking about our pollination, we have to talk about the ocean and we have to talk about how that's linked because, again, we're talking about water. We're talking about basically most of the planet. And if we're talking about pollination and how that underpins our life on Earth, we have to talk about most of the life on Earth, which exists, you know, not on land, but in the water. And so I think um, even when we're talking about pollination um, and insects and invertebrates, we have to talk about corals. We have to talk about invertebrates in the ocean and how they affect um, pollinators on land. Um, we have to talk about um, whales and what they do in terms of their ingestion of the matter in the ocean and, and what they do in their release of gases. And we, you know, we have to talk about all of these different things and how they're interlinked. And so I think I would not ever be able to talk about pollination without talking about the ocean because they're so intimately um, linked. Wow, I never really thought about pollination being more than just like to do with insects and plants. It's it's really really cool actually, and I think um, it first kind of drew my attention when I realised that um, one I may have been on the wrong course, but when I started my degree, the first presentation that I did was actually on um, pollinators and bees and it, it got a good grade but my lecturers were like you know you do realize you're on a marine biology degree why are you doing a presentation on insects and I was like because I love insects and you gave me that as one of the topics so I think it, I think it, what it really told me was that you can link everything because everything is linked you just have to try hard to find those things and in trying hard to find those links you actually understand more about the topic than if you hadn't looked in the direction that everyone told you not to look in. So I think that's a really, it's a really good thing um, in terms of STEM as well in science, is that when we're told to look in a certain direction, you kind of have to think to yourself, yeah, but what if I looked in the other, other direction? What would I find there? And if I am looking in that direction and trying desperately to make everyone look in that direction, what am I finding out and how am I dissecting the subject that I'm actually doing? And I think that's, it's a really cool thing that that taught me was that, you know, this might not on the surface look like it's linked, but it actually is. And I think it taught me a lot about intersectionality and social activism that I do as well. So many questions that I wouldn't have ordinarily thought of. Yeah. Sticking with the marine theme, do you have a favourite marine creature and why? Oh, that is so hard. My God. It's a big question. It's like <laughs> people ask me what my favourite bug is. I always struggle. <laughs> well, it used to be the orca. And I, you know, I loved orcas just because of their immense... It's almost their immense power because whenever you see anything on orcas, what's talked about is their intense, it's the intelligence, it's the strength, it's the 
it's the communication everything's there they're this super being that literally if you know if they were to exist on the same sort of plane of existence as humanity we just wouldn't exist because they would be the top predator it's you know they are so very powerful but i think more recently i've come to love the small and the the tiny i think in the oceans and i think that's made it a bit harder, I think, to kind of think about what my favorite marine animal is, because it used to be I would be so almost awestruck by the power of orcas that I'd just be like, that. that is my favorite marine animal. Um, but I think more recently, it's probably going to be a shark, and it's probably going to be a goblin shark. Um, mm. So I... Uh, I think, um, so at the BBC, I, I was researching um, a few animals and this was one of the animals that I researched extensively and it is the most weird looking creature on the planet. <laughs> it is just this crazy looking alien um, shark that is fascinating and it lives so deep down in the ocean that we just don't know that much about it at all. We don't know, we know very little about its mating techniques, its breeding techniques, we don't know how it gives birth. We just don't know anything about it and it looks extraordinary and i think for me animals that live that deep down are just they hold a great a deep fascination for me and whilst i still love the power of the orca and the almost the the kind of the wisdom and grandeur of whales i just i'm drawn to these weird strange little animals below the below the oceans that we can't see and i think that has to do with my almost my, my recent love of my own kind of journey in terms of being queer and being different and finding out, you know, this strange sort of weirdness around me, finding it very beautiful. And so I think that's why I find the Goblin Shark so beautiful and so incredibly amazing because we just don't know enough about it and I would love to find out more. Yeah, I suppose it's almost kind of feels like magic when you're thinking about things that we don't know much about, I guess. Do you know why it's called a Goblin Shark? Because I have no idea. I think it's because when it was, um, so when it was hauled up above the waves, however long ago for the first time, it really does look like a goblin. And it looks, <laughs> you know, it, I don't know if you've seen a picture of one, but um, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting looking shark, I'll put it that way. Um, and it does, it does have that monstrous kind of look to it. And I said, I think that's why it's called a goblin shark. I, I can't remember exactly if that is the reason, so I wouldn't quote me about that, but um, I think that is the reason. It's just, it looks like a goblin, um, and, and it does, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty good name. <laughs> I'll have to go and look them up. Do you have a favourite species in general? Like, not just marine? Anything you can pick from? That's a massive question. That is, that's even harder. That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. It would probably. <laughs> hmm. So there's um, there. So when I when I kind of um, talk about animals that I really am inspired by, I usually go to invertebrates because again, it's just that love of invertebrates there. And there is a snail that lives um, basically on um, volcanic ash and it is a vampire snail. Oh, is it a vampire snail? It might not be a vampire snail, but it's it's a snail that basically uses the, the material from the volcanic um, kind of material that is around it to build its shell. So it has an almost volcanic-esque shell and it is bright red and it is this beautiful looking snail and it's quite, quite big as well. And I own um, two giant African land snails and um i think my fascination with snails has kind of spawned into looking looking about and seeing what kind of different snails exist outside of the small garden snails that are in our gardens um and i think that just kind of drew my attention aside from that probably something um i guess something more close to home would probably be um uh, something that i'm more fascinated with i'm just trying to think through animals i like i did recently go on the um Port Conservation Trust um, podcast and talked a bit about raptors and birds because I've, they hold a special place in my heart. And I talked about the little owl and about how that's my favourite species of owl. So I'd say if maybe if things came out on top, it would be 
goblin shark, little owl, and maybe um, a few species of snails, and probably an ironclad beetle. They are incredible. They're so fascinating. They basically they have this armor that is so thick that you you know you you step on it, you try and pierce it, it just nothing happens. Uh, and um, I think one of the um, most amazing things about them is that because of their resilience, they can also play dead for many years without having to eat anything or drink anything. So they're used as ornaments and they're pinned on people's coats. And you just have this beetle that's just not dead. And it's just sitting there being like, if I play dead, they're never going to know that I'm here. And it's like, we're using you as an ornament. So <laughs> that's, I think that's quite cool as well. That was something that I had to look at um, a while ago. But yeah, I think it's just the weird and the wonderful. If I, if you look at um, animals, but then also, I think um, maybe even the completely normal, I say normal because um, quote unquote normal, because nature is not normal. <laughs> but I think, you know, if I were to talk about favorite animal and one that I would see a lot of, or I used to see a lot of probably European badger, I love badgers. I right. used to go badger fishing a lot, and they really do hold a special place in my heart. I think, um, yeah, maybe we'll go with badger. That was a long journey to get there, but maybe we'll go with badger. That's a good conclusion. That's the thing, though. There's so much wildlife. It's so diverse and vast. It's just impossible to choose one because they're all so different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moving on, you mentioned you worked at the BBC. Could you go into a little bit about what you did there? So I was a junior researcher um, at the Natural History Unit and also at BBC Earth for about a year. Um, and basically, as a researcher, your job is to provide information on whatever programme you're on in terms of sort of extra information, information about celebrities, about wildlife, about whatever programme you're doing, if there's you know, something in there that needs research, you'll be the one to do it. And you'll be the one to bolster up basically the info pack on these different characters almost um, so that you can put together a show. Um, and I found it really cool and really interesting. And I got to do a lot of cool stuff in terms of um, different skills I never thought I'd be able to do before. I will admit it did get a bit a bit much, but that's just because I think um, as a science communicator, and as also someone who is a trans person of colour and is also kind of working in this industry, I would say um, kind of alone on a lot of projects because of who I am and because there isn't really anyone else in this sphere who looks or kind of has the same experiences as me. Um, it got to this point where I was kind of fighting a lot of battles and trying to do a lot of things at the same time. And so um, I think um, everyone, I think, who's working in the wildlife sphere does have to be mindful of burnout because we're all fighting a battle for nature. And unfortunately, <laughs> there are a lot of people against that at the moment. So um, I think that's what we all have to keep in mind. But it was very interesting and it was useful. And yeah, I think a lot of it was writing about wildlife that was strange and unassuming and also celebrities that connect to wildlife and people who are interested in it. I got to talk to quite a few people and I got to sit in a room called the Atom Room so that's quite an achievement I think because <laughs> that was pretty cool um which yeah it was just I think it was kind of amazing to me because I and surreal that's the word it was surreal because I, this you know I as someone who'd watched Spring Watch since I was super super young to go past rooms where it was made and to be in rooms where country file literally would just um, you know had files just sitting around of past country file um, shows and episodes and David Attenborough was passed all over the rules and there was just bits and pieces of whatever I'd grown up on and whatever I'd loved as a kid that had made me enjoy wildlife so much was in that building and to be able to work there was an amazing surreal experience and I hope to maybe you know go back at some point because it is what I want to do is to be a wildlife filmmaker um, full time and instead of simply doing it as freelance that's you know i think that's something that to an extent we all probably want to do we want to be able to explore the world and to look at wildlife um and to be able to help it and conserve it but also enjoy the job that we're doing yeah kind of coming off from one of the points you mentioned in there like with all your work in diversity and inclusion within stem there'll be people that looked up to you as inspiration 
And do you have any advice for someone who might be facing barriers and discrimination within STEM communications? Like, what would you say to them? I think, um, I think I'd one go back on advice I've given before, which is to stay strong and keep going because I think that's a bit empty. Those words are a bit empty. I think sometimes, especially when you're struggling a lot, it can feel a bit rubbish when someone's just like, "Stay strong, do it," and you're just like, "Yeah, yeah but wow." And so I think what's most important is to find people who understand your perspective and where you're coming from and stick with them. And I think what I'm trying to say, I guess, is to find a support system because that's the most important thing when you're working in an environment that doesn't give you a lot of energy, it doesn't give you a lot of juice and you are running low on that energy and that juice, you need to be able to rest you need to be able to sit down and collect your thoughts and you need to be able to do that so you can continue the fight in that atmosphere. So I would say, even if it isn't in the wildlife arena, find a support system that helps you. Find a structure that when you are tired of fighting or when you're tired of trying to get your ideas through and trying to make something that has never been made before, you've got somewhere to rest. I think society nowadays does not place a great deal of value on rest and really we should be placing so much more value because it you know rest is almost the answer to a society that is truly um ableist you know racist misogynistic anything that we have that um discriminates against people that links into rest because um we have a very fast moving society and i'd say this of the wildlife film industry as well it's very fast moving but if you look at nature nature has always been something that's taken its time and has always been something that promotes rest so yeah i'd say find a support structure find people who understand where you're coming from and i understand that's hard because that is the whole point but like you know i'm here we are we are here and we are mobilizing and i think if yeah if if someone is struggling and they're coming from a similar perspective i'd say you need to find somewhere to rest because it's too hard to do it on your own. That makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think rest is so important. I think it's so easy to get caught up with day to day life and just not rest. Yeah, exactly. And I, it's just, it's especially if you're working with wildlife, I think um, you yeah. just need to give some good time because everything is, you know, even if, if you're filming a sequence of anything or if you're looking or studying wildlife in any way, you're going to be there for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's one of them things where it always becomes idealistic that, oh yeah, you'll be out filming wildlife, but it isn't so intense mm -hmm. that, yeah, taking time to rest is so vital. Definitely agree. Sticking with the, the TV theme, I guess, our last guest was Stacey and she was part of a CBB show called Teeny Tiny Creatures. And we believe that you also worked with them. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you did with them and the experience? That was really, really cool, actually. Um, yeah, so that was the first, I think that was the first thing that I'd ever done where I'd been um, contributing to a, a, a TV show about wildlife. I did that when I was at uni, um, actually before I even got um, a job at BBC. And basically I was called, I was uh, not called, I was emailed. Um, and this um, researcher um, basically reached out and said, you are a marine biologist, you're studying marine biology. You talk about um, marine animals and wildlife. Um, and we are filming a, an episode of this show called Teeny Tiny Creatures. Um, it will be released in a year, so even if you film it now, you're going to have to wait a hell of a long time. Yeah, but we're, we're doing this show and we're going to be talking about starfish. And we would love you to come down um, and talk about starfish at the at this Sea Life Centre. And I was like, this is absolutely amazing. This is incredible because I love talking about starfish. And this is going to be a bit of an adventure because I've never done anything like this before. And so, yeah, so I travelled down and met the presenter who um, is Chantelle, who is absolutely incredible and so, so lovely. And uh, we were sort of talking about starfish, we were talking about sea stars and the fact that they aren't technically called starfish anymore. They are called, um, they are literally just called stars, sea stars. 
Um, and the fact that because they're not actually fish, which, you know, as I always say that, and then I'm sort of like, well, yeah, but what about seahorses? They're not really horses, but never mind. Um, it, it's like, it, it's, it, it was a really cool experience and it was something that I won't, I won't be forgetting because I got to be able to actually hold starfish and all sea stars and I got to talk about bristle stars and I got to talk about all of these different organisms and about crabs and um, yeah, just go into detail about marine wildlife, which I absolutely adore. But I got to do it on a show that was for kids as someone who is, um, you know, is someone who isn't usually seen talking about natural history. And especially to be able to do that and to be part of that, that whole family, I was quite honored to be um, invited. And yeah, I think it was just, it, it was just really, really fun. And I really hope um, I'd be able to do that again, I think. And I think that kind of led into some of the other um, stuff that I'm doing, where it made it more easy for me to move into stuff where I was being filmed on camera and where I was talking about wildlife that I enjoy. Amazing. It does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> so we know that they're not called starfish anymore, but do you have any other cool starfish or sea star facts? Aside from, I don't know, what, what does... I guess people, because I, I always believe that people will kind of know everything about everything. And then I'm sort of like, oh, sometimes people just don't know some of the facts. Um, uh, I guess, because everyone knows that sea stars can grow their arms back up the bit off, I'm pretty sure. Um, I guess a, a cool fact about them um, would be that they, well, they're, so they're related to sea anemones. So when you when you talk so you're talking about this fleshy base and you're talking about these wiggly little tentacle arms that come out of the ground um, or, or, or out of this fleshy base and they're going upwards and that's the structure of a sea anemone. And when you're talking about a starfish, you're talking about these fleshy arms that come outwards from a middle structure. Um, and when you're talking about um, other sort of invertebrates, you're talking about how they are kind of round sometimes or their structure is one of a shell and it closes around things and so actually when you deconstruct what a starfish looks like you can understand who it's related to and the fact that they are actually also related to jellyfish and jellyfish are related to coral and so I think it's really cool to think about where starfish come from and about how they're related to all of these other invertebrates in the ocean and you just have to look at how they're structured because starfish really are some of the most fascinating and or sea stars are some of the most fascinating invertebrates in the in the ocean and i think what's um, what's interesting also is to talk about how specific sea stars have almost evolved different features so that they can survive in the environments that they are in so um you know, certain sea stars have horns, certain sea stars have armor that has spikes on it, certain sea stars are poisonous, um, some are extremely small, some are huge. There's this specific species that has tons and tons of legs and actually eats a lot of coral and sometimes even other starfish or sea stars that it finds. And, you know, that they just, they're a very varied group um, when you think about it and when you look into it more. And I think, that's kind of what needs to be maybe talked about more is about how different they are. It's not just this five fingered star almost that exists on the seafloor. It is this wealth of of um, different organisms with different features and different characteristics. And dare I say different personalities. And they're so easy to see as well. It's not like you have to go diving. You can just go rock pooling around the coast and you can find all sorts. It's amazing how different they all are as well. Because, like, I feel like when you think starfish, you think just, like, the orange, like, standard starfish. You also do a lot of journalistic work and storytelling. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about your interest in this and how it began? So my my love of writing and my love of storytelling actually started before I even um, did my degree or anything like that. I So I started writing a blog when I was about, um, I guess, sort of from the ages of nine to 12. Between that time anyway, I started writing the blog. And I all this book was, was observations that I made about wildlife around me 
in the city and then when I moved to the place of the garden what wildlife is in my garden what species there were I remember at some point when I was younger I tried to document every single species that existed in my garden I got to about 150 and that contained a lot of tiny little wasps and moths micro moths <laughs> and it was just like this is way too many but it was you know it was fun when it while it whilst it lasted um and so that was basically what sparked off writing about things and I used to do a lot of fiction writing when I was younger and I just had this real love of storytelling and now what I think about and when I talk about storytelling is the fact that storytelling has been passed down in you know humans through the ages and it is one of the most powerful forms of communication that we have it is one of the ways that we have passed information to each other it is one of the ways that we change perspectives about things you know films books podcasts radio shows anything even comics and paintings these are all ways of telling stories these are storytelling methods and so i think when i talk about storytelling i'm talking about the greatest type of communication that humanity has been able to master and one of the things that has almost allowed us to build the societies that we exist in is storytelling and so i love to be a storyteller and so one of the ways that i realized that i could do that is through writing and i started to write um, on my blog and then i moved into articles for other bloggers other wildlife bloggers and then did small stints um, on the editorial board of um, the junior paper for the wildlife trusts and basically what i was trying to do was just talk about what i was passionate about and write about what i was passionate about and i just found it really fun to write about wildlife and to write about the conservation that i saw around me and that has kind of led into me talking about deeper kind of darker topics because i really use that voice to talk about opinions that i have on race i can talk about opinions that i have on sexuality on you know on queerness i can talk about how that relates to the environment and conservation and, and how me being someone who is of pakistani descent can relate to the climate um the climate crisis and how you know how we can basically link all of these things together and i learned about the term intersectionality a while ago and it really fully described what i was talking about i just i realized that what i'm trying to do is link up all of these loose ends that i found in my life and i'm doing it through writing and so i think that's what my love of journalism is it's a love of storytelling but also of uplifting the stories of other people because i love reporting as well i think being a journalist and a reporter also is extremely cool and i've done a few articles where i've um, interviewed other people before um i did a recent one for bbc wildlife which was on um, diversity in the conservation sector and that was a really cool thing to do because that was about nine hours of interviews with different conservationists um, that I had to research um, through different social media directions. And that was just something I think that allowed me to see that not only do I want to write about my own opinions, I also want to write about other people's opinions and use the power that I have in writing to uplift other people's voices. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. And I'm trying to use that journalism to do other things that I wanted to do. So I am also looking to become an author, hopefully, and that will be something that um, is kind of, it's been top of my list since I was quite young. So we'll see how that goes, but I'm trying to use the journalism, the, the skills I've gotten from that to actually sit down for long enough to be focused to write maybe a quarter of a book. We'll see. When you write a book, you'll have to come back on the podcast and talk about it. You'll have a little book feature. <laughs> Do you have a favourite thing within the natural world or just in the world in general to talk about like, through journalism? Mm, I think, so I always view my journalism in kind of, not two separate ways, but two kind of vague ways, I guess, where I kind of talk about conservation journalism, a biology, where I'm talking about wildlife that I love and maybe reporting on something or have an opinion on wildlife and conservation. Um, and that, when I talk about that, I like to talk about my journey in wildlife and nature. And then I like to talk about the people who I've met along the way. And I like to talk about the animals that I've seen. And I think that is mainly about journeys and about journeys in nature and about how we all learn to love our wildlife. That's a favorite topic I have when I talk about um, things when I'm writing about conservation in my journalism. But when I'm writing other types of journalism, 
my, I think my favorite thing to talk about, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's probably the thing that I talk about the most is, um, I think how much I've realized nature is queer. So I did, I did this, um, this panel for, uh, which is a wildlife film festival, um, which is a really incredible wildlife film festival that's actually happening at the moment. I can't be there though, because I live in England, but, um, <laughs> It's, it's a really amazing wildlife film festival. And one of the panels that we did was out in, out in the wild. And we talked about how nature is queer with a group of queer people who basically were talking about how transness, how queerness, how spectrum based learning is really the way forward because we've been taught about biology and conservation and nature in a very binary fashion. And we've just been talked to, you know, we've been told that it's one thing or the other. Science is very narrow. It's for a certain kind of person who happens to be a rich, usually English speaking, cis male white guy. And, uh, you know, that's basically what science has been for. That's who that's been for. But we need to basically break it down and realize that actually conservation and wildlife and the world of wildlife and the world of social justice and the world in general should be talked about in a spectrum based way and a spectrum based fashion. Because that allows, you know, that allows people who aren't men to come forward, who aren't cis men to come forward and be amazing in this sphere and to really learn about wildlife and nature and to talk about it because we, I think, as people who have a different perspective of the world, based on how we've had to grow up and had to reflect on our own lives in order to actually be in this sector at all, we generally have a greater understanding of how nature works because nature is all about reflection and it's all about how things aren't just one thing or the other, they're everything all at the same time. I think a lot of the time what's happened before is that we talked about nature and conservation almost as if it's this different entity to humans, almost as if it's this different topic to the issues of poverty, of homelessness, of, um, of social justice, of you know the problems of the global south, global north, problems that people have around the world. But really, it's so intimately linked. We are so intricately connected to our natural world that we need to be able to speak about conservation but also speak about some of the other issues that people are facing in the world and connect that to the natural world. Um, and so I think going forward, that's something I guess that I'd like to see change in the natural history sphere. I would like people who are maybe on TV, who are writing about natural history to also talk about the issues that are facing humans in the world, because once you start splitting them apart, you're not really talking about nature anymore. You're just talking about something that you think is happening, but you can't really see below it. And so I would say that what I want to see more is for people to be linking up the dots. I want to see a more intersectional approach to wildlife and conservation. Um, and I hope that we can kind of get there. Moving on again to another tangent, we're going back to the bumblebees. So you're an ambassador for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Can you tell us a little bit about your work with them and maybe if you have a good bumblebee fact to tell us? Oh, this is, I love talking about bumblebees. I could talk about them for so long, my God. I, so with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, that was a really interesting story because when I first started kind of talking on Twitter about wildlife at all, um, I actually, I, so my username is Go Wild for Bees. And it was that because I was basically trying to uplift a specific campaign which talks about how the growth of verges and wildlife, uh, uh, sorry, wildflower um, sections in our meadows and in our cities is so very useful for pollinators because pollinators love native wildflowers. So by literally just allowing verges in our cities to grow um, and verges are small areas of grass or wildflowers, um, basically they could be near roads, they could be by pathways, they could literally just be any area of green grass that has wildflowers in it in cities or anywhere and by just allowing them to grow you save money on cutting them down you um you know save money on pollution because these are areas that provide a good way of siphoning off a lot of the um, dangerous pollution that we have in our cities but also they provide a massive food source for all of our pollinators that exist in cities and we have a lot of pollinators in cities um, and so i thought that was an extremely useful campaign to get behind and i still stand by you know, not cutting verges, not mowing your lawn. I think it's a really good way of increasing biodiversity in your garden, increasing biodiversity in the countryside is just by letting things grow. And it's such an easy way because you just don't do anything. Um, and so that's what kind of first introduced me 
on Twitter was as someone who just talked about bees all the time. And so I kept doing that. And it was only actually until I wrote an article on diversity for a focus on nature, who I now work as a committee member for, that I talked about diversity in nature. And the CEO of um, the Bombay Conservation Trust actually contacted me on Twitter. And she's so lovely, my God. Um, and we had a a really lovely conversation about bumblebees and she was like would you like to be an ambassador for the bumblebee conservation trust and i was obviously like yes of course i've talked about bumblebees my entire life it's the reason one of the reasons i love insects so much um it's one of the reasons i love wildlife i would jump at the chance so i think most of the work that i do now is basically sharing information about bumblebees bringing people up to date on bumblebees. I did a takeover of their Instagram where I just talked about bumblebees and pollinators and flowers and how it's so useful to look at the smaller things in our wildlife and in our natural world. Um, and also I, I did a film for the um, reintroduction and rewilding um, conference. Um, and this was a while ago now um, that was presented by um, Chris Packham uh, and Megan McCubbin. And it was a really beautiful um, festival that just talked about the rewilding stories that we've had in the last few years. And obviously we had red kites, um, we had um, a few other animals um, and we had uh, we had storks, they were amazing. And we also had the short tail bumblebee, yeah, the short head um, bumblebee, short tailed or the short head bumblebee. This is really embarrassing now. I made a film about it, I can't remember. But um, so this bumblebee is an extraordinary little insect and unfortunately it hasn't come back to the UK, but in the attempts to reintroduce and rewild the environment around this bumblebee to allow it to come back. Three or four other species of bumblebees have made a return. Lots of other biodiversity has gone up in the UK and also essential links have gone, have, have come back up between farmers and landowners and wildlife activists and conservationists because it really highlighted the need for everyone to be involved in the reintroduction of this essential insect. And so again, the work that I do, it can really be anything, but it's all it is, is to basically be an ambassador for bumblebees and to talk about bumblebees wherever I can, which I did anyway, so it's a pretty easy job. That's really great. I suppose bees are like a fairly accessible gateway insect for getting people into nature because they can see it in their garden. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Do you have a favourite bee? Oh, do I have a favourite bee? Um, I do. Um, so there is this bee called the blue mason bee and it is bright blue and it is extraordinary and it's so beautiful. Um, and I've never seen one in real life, but I hope to one day. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that would be an, a really amazing bee to see. And at the moment, that is my favourite bee. That's a good answer. <laughs> a bright blue bee. I don't bee. think I've seen one. I'd love to go and have a look. What are the best ways for attracting bees in your garden? Um, probably, so this is a really, um, it's, a, it's such a varied way I think you can do this, but I think, like I said before, allowing wildflowers to grow, even if you need to cut down areas of grass, please just leave bunches of wildflowers or areas of grass to grow high because bumblebees love native wildflowers and it's, it's so much better for the biodiversity to have a varied culture of plants in your garden and not to have a monoculture because what we don't want is to force native bumblebees out because there's only one type of plant that only one insect likes um, because that has happened a lot of the times before and that's why we have a decline in bumblebees because they just don't have anything to eat. So I'd say letting your burgers grow but also having places for them to nest. So um, bumblebees love to nest is where it is warm where it's dark and so we have our bee boxes which are really really useful for attracting um lots of different species of bumblebees but i'd say allowing your garden to grow providing homes and nesting places which can, can can be as simple as bee boxes or piles of wood or even just areas of soil that no one really touches because obviously we have our burrowing bees um and if you see bumblebees flying around not to spray things on them and to kind of you know to to be scared of them because really a bumblebee is not going to sting you unless you're really attacking a hive or something bad is happening i understand the trepidation with people because stings hurt but 
what I also discovered recently is that certain beasts, in fact, um, well, because from what we sort of learned before is that when a bee stings you, it dies because the barbed sting goes into you and pulls out all of its organs, unfortunately, and then it's, you know, it hasn't got any organs, so it probably won't survive very long, unfortunately. But what I recently learned is that actually some bees, when they sting you, they can turn around and unhook their barb from you and they can choose not to sting you and in fact don't inject you with anything and don't cause that much disruption except for maybe a small prick in your skin so um actually even then you don't have to be scared of bumblebees so i'd say not attacking them allowing veggies to grow and providing areas for them to nest um is just some of the easiest ways i think that you can attract bees to your garden and your garden will very much be better off for bumblebees being in it Absolutely. Do you have any tips for people wanting to learn to ID the bees that they see? Definitely. I think um, there are so many good ID guides on the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website. These ID guides are brilliant because all they're basically doing is reducing all of the kind of questions we've got about bumblebees to stripes and wings and features that you can see very easily when you look at a bumblebee closely. And this is kind of about everyone being more comfortable around bumblebees, because once you're more comfortable around them, you can look at them closer. And then you can look at the fact that, oh, this bee has a slightly orange tail or has a tinge to the edge of its tail, which is different than this bee, which has two yellow stripes on its back. And this bee has no stripes at all and a red tail. And that you start to discover that there's so many different varieties of bumblebee. So I'd say, a tip for identifying them is to look at the stripes bit. I think my main tip is to go on the Bumblebee Conservation Trust website and to just look at the ID guides that they have because there's lots of free resources over there. There's free resource packs that you can get sent to you and it will just help you identify bees better and to know more about them, which, you know, will help you love them. That's great. Here on Nature Positivity, we like to end our episodes with our nature highlights of the week. Jasmine, do you have a nature highlight? I'm kind of struggling to think of one, to be honest, because I've been out and about. Um, I did go to look for badges earlier um, this week when it was um, one of my partner's anniversary. And we went um, to a, um, a, a place called um, Ashton Park in Bristol. Um, Ashton Court. Might be Ashton Court. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we went there and to be honest, I didn't really expect to find any badges there because I've never actually heard of badges being there, but I'd hoped to see something. Instead, I did find four different species of spiders um, and I absolutely love spiders. So that was a real win. Um, and yeah, I think for me, the nature highlight was finding four different species of spiders um, in one day when I was looking for badges. Um, and that was, you know, I think that's probably my nature highlight. Another nature highlight, but not Really, one is kind of cheating because I didn't really see it in real life, but I did look up how hedgehogs drink water and they're so cute. So I think that's probably a good highlight. <laughs> I need to look that up. I feel like it'd be really cute. It's so cute, my God. What about you, Holly? So the other day I was getting ready for bed, brushing my teeth in the bathroom, and then a moth was flying up near the window, just fluttering about. Aww. So I just had a nice view of a moth whilst I was brushing my teeth. <laughs> do you know what it was? I do not know, unfortunately. I'm not very good with moth. Oh. ID, but should have sent me a picture. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Karis? Uh, mine was on my walk to work this morning. Uh, I saw a bird that wasn't a seagull and wasn't a pigeon. And bearing in mind, I live in the centre of Bristol, so I was very confused. Um, <laughs> and so I posted it on my Instagram to find out what it was. And it turned out it was a bird called a shag. So that was an interesting find. <laughs> And that was my nature highlight of the week. We didn't have cups of teas today, but Jasmine, I imagine your cup of tea has all gone now, which must mean it's the end of the episode. Really loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been so cool. Thank you so much for chatting with us today about your amazing work. And we'll put all of Jasmine's social media information in the description so you can check it out. Don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find our details in the description of this episode and keep an eye out for our next episode. Thanks again, Jasmine, for joining us today, and thank you for listening to Nature Positivity.